So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. I'm Frederick Dunn, and today my very special guest is Dr. Samuel Ramsey, aka Dr. Bugs, or just Dr. Sammy. Dr. Sammy is renowned for his research on the Varroa destructor mite, as well as his more recent studies of the Tropa Lalaps mite. He will soon be the endowed professor of entomology at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Here's Dr. Sammy. My name is Samuel Ramsey. Uh, they call me Dr. Sammy, or Sammy for short. Uh, I am an entomologist. Um, I'm currently working with the United States Department of Agriculture, but as of next month, will be CU Boulder's new professor of entomology. Um, and let's see, who are you, where are you? Right now, I'm in Washington, D.C., but soon I'll be re relocating to Colorado. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sammy, for being here and agreeing to do this interview because I've looked forward to talking with you, I'm not kidding, over a year, because I've <laughs> seen a lot of your presentations and you have this very charismatic delivery. So now we have a lot to talk about, but I also have some informal stuff to talk about because we have to know a little bit more about you. And in one of your, I believe it was even your TED talk, because I was going to ask you in the beginning, why entomology and at what point in your life did you decide that that was like the thing for you and i love this quote because i use it all the time and i wrote it here on my folder people fear what they don't understand and you have an interesting fear what was it i was absolutely terrified of insects which is a strange thing for anyone to hear an entomologist to say <laughs> and so you uh that fear was used against you by your siblings yeah how many how many siblings do you have <laughs> I have an older brother and an older sister and you know being the youngest in and by far the smallest shrimpiest of the kids uh, I did incur uh, a fair amount of teasing from uh, from my older sister mostly but also from my older brother at times and for my sister one of her favorite pastimes seemed to be to find a big juicy extremely leggy insect to just toss it on me and be like, Sammy, there's a bug on you. And uh, I, uh, I didn't handle that well. Kind of ran around in circles screaming before falling out in a heap. And uh, it was a bit of a mess for a while. Uh, that's really unusual for the sister to be the one. Because <laughs> that shows that she wasn't afraid of bugs. Not at all. Either that or her end game was, you know, she was so fixated on getting a scare out of you that she overcame her own fear to gather that. I put a spider on a tree and left my sister up in that tree for a long time when I was little. I can, I had three sisters. Fred! But uh, I know Dude. that was wrong. Wasn't that wrong? <laughs> no, I was wrong. I'm glad Just, you can admit that. <laughs> was that daddy long legs? They, as we know, they can't even bite. And it's great that you're here because I have so many questions. And we're going to mm -hmm. cover every single one of them in the Dude, time that we have. By the way, here, I so. love your setup back there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's. I tell people sometimes that that's a picture, but it's actually, I set this up myself. It looks great. Yeah. And I, I have, have a little, a... I have a prop here that you would appreciate. Ah, nice. Where did you get that, by the way? I can't tell. Anyway, oh. no, it's it was sent to me by somebody. It was a 3D print, but I painted yeah. it myself. So, Oh, nice. I realized that it looks like more like, like a lobster now that I see it. Yeah. It looks like a cooked lobster. Like, you know. <laughs> But the details aren't bad. What about the scale? Is this accurate? If I were a bee? Uh, it's it's that, pretty accurate. It's pretty mm -hmm. accurate. Okay. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know what we're talking about right now, this is the Varroa destructor mite. Correct. Which Dr. Sammy knows a little bit about, and we're going to get into that. So I have to ask some other questions too, because a lot of people don't know. You are also called Dr. Bugs. Accurate. You have a YouTube channel that's called Dr. Bugs. Correct. Are you going to be updating that YouTube channel in the foreseeable future? <laughs> so let me tell you, I started that YouTube channel as a graduate student because I was in love with all of these science communication channels on YouTube, Kurzgesagt, SciShow, uh, ASAP Science, just incredible science communicators out there. But what I kept seeing was that None of the science communicators looked like or sounded anything like me. And I really wanted to jump in, add my own voice to the mix. 
so I had a couple of friends who told me that they would, you know, they might be able to, to help me with this endeavor. I decided to jump in. They couldn't help me with this endeavor. And so uh, I ended up doing pretty much the whole thing by myself, start to finish. Oh, they were going to help you do post-production work and stuff? Yeah, post-production, pre-production, filming. Okay, so here's something. And for those of you that are watching or listening on Podbean, don't go to that channel yet. But you're going to find out, as I did, Dr. Sammy is an exceptional talent. I'm not just talking about entomology or charismatic communication or the ability to connect on many levels with many uh, age groups, we could say. So like if... Phil Nye, the science guy, were an entomologist, only with a better personality, it would be Dr. Sammy. Aww. So, but your musical ability, you Aww. sang a song about the cicada. <laughs> I thought at first he's got to be lip syncing with somebody because you can't have this voice. So it, what that tells me is you've had a lot of options really in life, mm -hmm. uh, paths you could have chosen. And yes. obviously performing arts could have been one of them. Do you have some kind of background in performing arts? The most background that I have in performing arts um, as a child. So both of my parents are pastors. Uh, as a child, they uh, always wanted to involve us in the, the work of the church. And so I spent a lot of my time uh, leading worship and singing. And uh, whenever there were plays at church, um, I was always... Uh, let me see. I've played Jesus twice. Uh, I've played Cain and Cain and Abel, uh, Joseph. Wait, that means you killed people. What? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. I played Abel. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so I was actually always the person who got killed or thrown down into a cistern or something. Um, and I wanted to, you know, get to one of these days, stretch my acting muscles and get to be Cain or Judas or something. It never, yeah. never really worked out. Everybody uh, typecast me. <laughs> That's really interesting. And as, as a lot of us know, um, there are some world-class vocalists and performing artists who started out in church, just like Absolutely. you're describing. Absolutely. So that's really an interesting, unexpected kind of background there. Mm -hmm. um, and so both your parents are pastors. That's yeah. interesting too. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so anyway, but none of your parents said, hey, you know, you really should pursue uh, singing or something they they wanted you to go to college was that kind of a family mandate i wouldn't say a family mandate but it was very clear to me so uh, my my dad grew up um in in alabama he was subjected to a lot of of racism and didn't really have the support system that he wished that he had had growing up my dad is a mm -hmm. super curious person um whenever i would meet his family members from alabama they would talk about just how much of a uh, a, a curious kid he was always off in the woods playing with stuff and finding cool things well he didn't really have the opportunities that I have available um, to to pursue something like science my mom she graduated top of her class graduated a year early tried very hard to go to college but was working three jobs at the time because she had no support system to send her so for both of my parents it was very clear to me that for me to go to college meant that I could finally do something that they didn't have the ability to do. Uh, mm. And I really wanted to make sure that that was the first direction that I went in. And if music or something else presented itself along the way, um, mm -hmm. potentially I'd pursue it. But finishing school and pursuing being an entomologist always made the most mm -hmm. sense to me. So you knew when you were little, entomology, as soon as you could pronounce it and spell it, that was what you were yep. going to be. Age seven, told my mom I'm going to be an entomologist when I grow up. Okay. I was going to be a herpetologist oh. or a theology specifically ever since I was in first grade. That's huh. I, that's Is I that your up. day job? No. <laughs> I ran away from home. I joined the Navy. Anyway, oh. it's not about me. I did underwater imaging. So a lot of fun. Very cool. Anyway, but then I went full circle. And guess what? You went to a school that I'm familiar with. So I'm going to just take a wild stab at it. You might have gone to Cornell. I might have gone to Cornell. That you is accurate. You graduated in about, I don't know, 2011 or something. Accurate. You have done your homework, sir. Well, I just, I just felt that number just kind of appeared in my subconscious. <laughs> I have this ability that I don't like to brag about. But uh, so, no, of course <laughs> I looked it up. 
Cornell University. So did you have anything to do at all with the Dice Lab while you were there? Or was that still closed at the time? Uh, I wish I had something to do with the Dice Lab. I wish I had gotten the opportunity to meet Tom Seeley. Uh, what? You didn't even work with him? Never even got to meet Tom Seeley. I feel like I'm still chasing him around because every time I go to one of these B meetings, they'll tell me, oh, the week before we had Tom Seeley here or next week we're going to have Tom Seeley. I still haven't met the guy. All yeah, you years. know what? He's going to retire and sneak away on us. <sighs> That's, I'm just telling you. Because he's this behaviorist, mm -hmm. you know, animal behavior. So he's got this yep. great background. And he went to some okay school called Harvard. I mean, he he's been around <laughs> just okay. So, you yeah, know, it's an okay school. He did all right there. It would have been great if he'd been a, a classmate of my stepfather's who was also at Harvard for biochemistry. Ooh. That's where he got his PhD. Nice. Um, but Dr. Seeley, boy, he is slippery. He is mm -hmm. hard to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. One of I these days, that. though, mark my words, I am going to meet Tom Seeley. All right. And if you need a photographer to come along, like a documentary style, if you need paparazzi, I'm with it. No, I'm right there with, with it, sir. Okay. Let's not bore everybody with all the neat stuff that we can do and tracking down Dr. Seeley. Oh, here's another thing I found out about you. You were gone for, is it six months to Thailand? Accurate. Did you just get back? I did just get back. Oh, uh, see, I just, time. again, I just felt like you had been abroad and I saw the world map in my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with Umberto Bon Cristiani telling me <laughs> <this> stuff. <laughs> so what we're so let's let's jump right into that. The tropa laylaps might. Oh my goodness! Uh, the... As if we don't have enough of a problem with the Verota striker might. Tell us what's going on, Doctor Sammy. So uh, you all may have heard that the Varroa destructor mites have officially become cosmopolitan parasites. They are now present on every continent now or every continent where bees are kept they're not in antarctica but now they're in australia as of uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago a few weeks ago um so varroa is a big deal and you kind of get this this feeling like i i felt kind of overwhelmed um when i heard about the whole monkeypox thing because we're not done with our current pandemic and it seems like there's another one already poised and ready the bees are probably feeling the same thing they are not done with their varroa destructor pandemic and now they've got this tropolalapse pandemic that's already poised and ready to, to fire off. Now, these tropolalapse mites, um, first of all, their name is ridiculous to pronounce. Tropolalapse mercedesi is just a tongue twister. So I like to call them the tropy mites. Before I started studying them, they didn't even have a common name. I gave them their common name. No one, uh, I shouldn't say no one, very few individuals are actually studying these creatures. Very little research has been conducted about them. But what is clear is that they kick bees butts, and multiple species. Varroa destructor has one or two species of honeybees that it has the capacity to parasitize. However, uh, there are um, multiple species of bees that the tropy mites can go after. We know that we've been able to find them in every group of uh, all, all of the subgenera of honeybees. So those would include the apis, um, your cavity nesting bees, the microapis, the tiny little dwarf bees, and the macrapis, the giant honeybees. It's very concerning that they can parasitize all three of those groups because none of our other um, big parasites are capable of doing that kind of thing. And then we've even found them in regular old native bees like um, the carpenter bees, which is still a, uh, a finding that I would love to confirm for myself, but there are reports of them in carpenter bee colonies and I've even uh, heard anecdotal reports of them in bumblebee nests. Now, I typically don't like to move forward the uh, anecdotal work and so on until it's confirmed, but there's just so little known about this creature at this point um, that I'm letting you know there are a lot of directions that research needs to go in to better understand this creature and very few people doing that work. Mm -hmm. And this is where you're going to focus your work going forward on the AAA labs, Mike? That's where I'm going to focus my work abroad. But yeah. in the U.S., I want to focus my work on Varroa. So when I'm yeah. overseas, when I'm in Southeast Asia, I'll be focusing on these tropy mites. I just completed a project uh, to try to fill in one huge gap in our knowledge of this creature. How can we kill these mites? So I've mm -hmm. tested four methods of treating for these creatures and hopefully that data will be published by the end of the year. I'm working on analyzing that data now. Um, 
And then when I'm in the US working out of my lab at CU Boulder uh, in partnership with the USDA, um, we've got some really great research on Varroa that we are looking to use to explore avenues um, to utilize the understanding that the mites are feeding on the fat body as a way of leading to their demise. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned the uh, mites feeding on the fat body. Mm -hmm. Aren't you the one that made that distinction before <laughs> we thought it was the hemolymph? And then are, aren't you the one that found out that we're actually feeding on stored fats in the peas? Fred, is this another one of your feelings? One of those feelings <laughs> that you just did? <laughs> My delivery is so, it just seems casual the way it comes out. Right? <laughs> but, oh, you, you know what? Let me, I think... Just on these headphones for a moment. <laughs> so tell us about the the mites. They feed on the fat stores. Mm -hmm. You did this great um, lecture. I think you were in, I don't want to get this wrong. Were you in Ireland or something? Yeah, Northern Ireland. And that's when you talked about um, kind of all of that and basically how you, and, and that was one of the funniest things too, was you go, and I call this mite. PhD. <laughs> so, that, so was that the premise of your, was that your thesis? That what? was my, th that was only, that was three chapters of my thesis. Um, there were two other chapters um, that one of which will be published soon and another of which I'm going to spend a bit more time focusing on. Um, but the, the big crooks of my thesis work was um, I started trying to figure out what these mites are feeding on. The data just wasn't lining up to my mind that they would be feeding on the bee's blood, uh, mm -hmm. which is primarily water, few dissolved nutrients, very low uh, number of cells in their, their blood. It just didn't seem like the mites would be able to get the nutrition necessary to lay these gigantic eggs that they're laying every 30 hours. Uh, it Several elements of it didn't make sense, uh, also down to the digestive system of the mites. They don't have a digestive system that's structured to deal with a huge influx of a, a water-based food source. Mm. Um, when creatures have to feed on something like that, they have all kinds of modifications that they have to make, or their food source will eventually kill them. And so uh, it, it became more and more apparent to me, the more research that I conducted, that even though we've been saying for um, more than half a century that these parasites are feeding on the bee's blood, we don't actually have the data to back that up. And so I... Oh, you're waiting for me to say... Oh, oh yeah, no, no, you look like... You know, everyone that committed to that, though, they had to have their minds blown because here's Sammy over here going, oh, no, no, the blood doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm going to look into that. You know, meanwhile, it's, it's an established across the board thing that everybody was saying. So that's... Yeah. I was actually a little bit concerned to jump into something like that as a yeah. early career researcher, um, as somebody who already kind of, uh, like I, I look a lot younger than I am. And mm -hmm. because uh, of the way that I present when I'm speaking, I, I tend mm -hmm. to sound younger than I am. Sometimes mm -hmm. people can feel a little bit, what's the word, cranky about somebody well yeah um, because they they get the impression that here's this uh fresh guy yes. coming in here with his fresh ideas stuff mm -hmm. in our apple cart that's been well stacked you exactly know? I mean, yeah i mean young who's whippersnapper sammy, who's sammy to come in and question what i did exactly and, and that's a problem because it's published you know i mean <laughs> people that's uh and for you to come in but that's great i mean that's that's one of the things that uh the the bravery you know the the whole idea and that's the beauty of science in my opinion too, and many others I hope, is that we can challenge and, and take apart and reevaluate mm -hmm. studies that have been done and we can find out every part of it. Does that make sense? And can we do more to either validate or challenge it? Precisely. So, so you went in there as a challenger. Well, it, so it wasn't originally my <laughs> goal to upend uh, half a century's worth of, of research on this organism, yeah. but there's also a greater good to it in knowing that uh, we, our, our honeybees, they've been getting their butts kicked by this parasite for some right. time now. Um, it was originally found in the U.S. in 1987, but prior to that, it was making its way through Russia, through China, through uh, South Asia, and leaving all of these dead bees in their wake before it got to mm -hmm. uh, South America, before it got to Europe, and mm -hmm. everywhere that it went, everywhere that it went, 
uh, colony losses went from like an average of 8% or so and mm-hmm. skyrocketed to somewhere between 33 and 50% losses. And mm-hmm. those can be unsustainable. Uh, for beekeepers, those can be unsustainable for the populations of bees. Uh, within 10 years of the arrival of Varroa destructor in the U.S., we had lost nearly all of our unmanaged honeybee colonies, the feral bees that live in tree holes and things. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. These parasites kick their butts. And Yeah, Dr. Uh, Seeley. I was just uh, about to say. That. Yeah, the Arnott <laughs> Forest. I mean, mm-hmm. all the feral colonies were basically gone. And then, mm-hmm. and this is this will segue me into the next conversation I want to have with you, which is because uh, there are a lot of people now because we're looking at Australia and we already mentioned them because now in New South Wales, they've got rotostructor mites. And for those who don't know, Australia was mite free and it was kind of a bragging point forever. (laughs) Uh, And so um, the early argument is that, well, if we had just left the bees alone, then those Mm. that survived Mm -hmm. would defeat the mite on their own. And this is kind of the whole foundation for even brand new beekeepers, because mm-hmm. it seems so holistic uh, to say, well, I'm just going to be treatment free and work with my yeah. bees that survive. Mm-hmm. And because I, I often start um, presentations with how many of you count mites, you know, and really like a third do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so what is your, uh, what are your observations and what's your stance on that? Can these backyard people and should they be trying treatment free? What, what are the ramifications kind of in both directions and what, what do you advise? Thanks for asking about that, Fred. Um, <laughs> when, when I first jumped in to bee research, I had no idea just how controversial of a question that would end up being. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been invited out to a lot of beekeeping groups over uh, my years of research. And um, I've talked to a lot of groups where I've been invited by one. Uh, at one point, I got invited by a group and when the uh, a local group found out that I had been invited by them, um, they took me off their schedule and said they weren't <laughs> inviting me anymore. Uh, yeah, it's it's a whole thing. But I later on found out that there was a, a big kerfuffle um, that caused the two groups to split off, and it was entirely about treatment. Um, is it a, should you be treating for mites? Should you not be treating for mites? And I know of more groups now that have split over that reason than any other reason. I just ends up being the thing. Well, it doesn't have to be such a divisive issue. Um, I I really think that we're thinking about it the wrong way. So let's, to my mind, the best way to start is from where we do agree. Where we all agree is that we want our bees to be healthy, from the people who want to treat uh, the colonies to get rid of the varroa mites, to the individuals who want the bees to do it themselves, and so they're not treating. Both groups look forward to a day where the bees are able to uh, take care of themselves and where there are no mites, where these problems have been solved. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's just a different idea of how we reach that point between those two groups. Um, There are individuals who believe we have to treat the colonies um, the same way that you wouldn't allow your cows to be roaming through a field um, with mange and ticks all over them and all kinds of problems. That would be an ethics issue. That would be a problem for um, how you treat animals. They feel the same way about these bees. And then there are others who feel that we're creating welfare bees by allowing um, the the weakest stock to survive by consistently treating Mm -hmm. them and protecting them from the mites. Well, here's the thing. The, the bee, Apis mellifera, that we are consistently rearing, it is part of a group of bees, the honeybees, the Apis bees, that all originated in South, or, um, they all originated in Asia, most likely Southeast Asia. And that area of the world is where you'll find the highest biodiversity of honeybees of anywhere in the world. Um, all of the different species are present just right there. Mm-hmm. Well, there was this one species Apis mellifera, they got the idea, it's not actually a great idea for all of us to just be together all the time because then we're constantly sharing parasites and diseases. I'm going to strike on my own and see the world. So these bees moved off into Europe and because they were in this area where they had no other competition from other honeybees, uh, they were able to be really successful. But In that, they lost the genetics that are related to suppressing uh, the vast majority of problematic parasites because they didn't have them anymore. All of those parasites were left behind, and they were able to dedicate all of that energy 
to making tons of honey and to being these uh, incredible pollinators. Well, now that we have reintroduced them to that region of the world, now that we have allowed them to be exposed to these parasites again, they are doing very poorly in the face of them. Every parasite seems to transition from the Asian bees to the European bee. And a big reason for that is evolutionarily, you can feed on these bees, you can attack them, you can exploit their colony, and they are not good at fighting back. They're actually quite terrible at it by comparison to all the other bee species. Any study that's compared uh, the genetics and the behavioral abilities of these bees to suppress parasites every single time, all of them without question show that Apis mellifera is the worst at suppressing its parasites by comparison to the other bees. So you will see in the future, more parasites transition over to Apis mellifera. Well, we have a responsibility because we have taken these bees out of their natural setting and we've put them in all kinds of areas that are not natural for them. And having done that, we are now saying, well, I want them to handle it the natural way. Well, you've mm -hmm. put them in an unnatural setting. You've taken them away from their typical natural context. And now we have to have further input into this system if we're going to keep these bees healthy. Furthermore, if we choose not to, we can unfortunately generate a much more problematic parasite in the process. In the natural setting, the bees don't like to live right next to each other. They'll usually right. choose a location that's about three kilometers away from any other bee colony. And the reason for that is you have to punish the worst and most problematic parasites. That is how symbiotic relationships work. If you don't punish the problematic parasites and pathogens, they will continue to get worse and worse and worse and exploit more and more and more until they eventually destroy their host. So if you have a system in place where if that parasite kills your colony, there are no other colonies around for it to get to and it dies too, there mm -hmm. is a strong incentive for it to not be so virulent that it kills its host. Mm -hmm. Well, what have we done as beekeepers? We've taken it out of its natural setting, set it next to a ton of other colonies and a big old apiary where that parasite can actually be rewarded for killing those bees. And mm. that has set up Varroa destructor to be a parasite with no checks and balances biologically in the system. So yeah, we do need to treat because these parasites can do a lot to overcome these hosts and they don't have all the tools necessary to suppress it on their own. There are individuals working on making sure that they do get those tools, but in the interim, we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. You're the first one I've heard put it that way, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this interview already. <laughs> and that's because, uh, as you said, uh, because I've thought this too, what good is a parasite that kills its host and ends up with no host? Um, but as you said, we're rewarding them. Oh, that one's down. Here's a new batch of bees. There's a new colony right here in the same apiary because they constantly bring in packages or whatever their, their method is, mm -hmm. but they're reinforcing the losses and then providing new places for the Varroa to move into. That you should you should do more with this. That's <laughs> you are you're on it. That is really that was really interesting. And yeah, that's the other thing too is today it's like the the groups all splinter up right down to what kind of hive you use. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so my thinking always has been and will continue to be it doesn't hurt you to have the knowledge. In other words, stick around, listen to what they say. Maybe you'll get some new idea, maybe you won't, but at least you'll also have uh, more information to base your own arguments on, you know? So you can't debate what you don't know, you know? Precisely. So the, the idea of just putting up a wall and say, oh, no, and la la, and I'm gonna walk away and I'm not mm -hmm. gonna hear what they've got to say. I wanna hear all points. Same, and this is why I'm such a big proponent of diversity. Getting all those points yeah. together gives you the opportunity to take all of them, weigh them out, use the beneficial elements of one with the beneficial elements of another, but choosing yeah. to only be around people who feel the same way that you do, say the oh, same yeah. things that you do is not going to help you in the long run. Sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely agree. That is it. Learn everything you can while you can. Okay. That is good stuff. And I hope people have not like checked out. Do not go and listen to Sammy's music yet. <laughs> okay. So there's other stuff here too. By the way, there's a brand new um, RNA research program. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you aware of it? Just mm -hmm. published. 
So what are your thoughts on that, uh, being able to vaccinate against the road destructor mite? <laughs> so have you I, did you see it did you see you know I, what I'm talking about I unfortunately haven't um read as, uh, enough about this I've just okay. read some of the abstract but yeah it seems really promising it's an yeah. exciting idea um, we actually need to do enough research on it where we've got a very 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 broad um, sample size, and we can mm -hmm. really see the impact that this has on different kinds of mites. All of the mites yeah. throughout the U.S. are not the same. Um, right. They yeah. don't even carry the same virus load. Exactly. Yeah. Different yeah. viruses and different haplotypes. So you know how COVID-19 has all of these different variants, and you can have mm -hmm. Delta, and you can have Omicron, and you can have all of these subvariants. Varroa destructor is the same way. We call them haplotypes. And in the U.S., we know for sure that we have two haplotypes of Varroa, uh, but there are these oddities between some of the haplotypes that we still haven't fully explained yet. Um, some mites that seem bigger, or not seem, some mites that are far bigger than others, smaller than others, and we're looking into whether this is representative of um, different uh, subtypes within these variants that we need to be on a lookout for. There's definitely differences in the um, virulence of these two different subtypes um, within the U.S. And so actually looking at how this, this research, um, how effective it is against the different genetic strains of Varroa destructor mm -hmm. will be really important. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So many different things going on at one time. And I'm going to, I'm going to bounce some questions off you that I get. Let's do this. Okay. Because you have a background also, you studied um, like predator insects yeah. and, and the symbiotic relationships mm -hmm. that some of these have. So this gets brought up to me all the time. Pseudoscorpions, book scorpions, yeah. whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had them you know, because I like to look at them and photograph them and take macro micros of them. Mm -hmm. And then someone will always say, if you just put those in your beehive, they will hunt out all the varroa mites and kill them and consume them. And that works. <laughs> so, yeah. I wish. So, I already know what the answer is going to be, but I'm, I'm using you <laughs> as my backup because because I've said if they go up into the brood area and and they might feed on the varroa destructor mite because I've seen that once they fall into the tray mm -hmm. and they find them in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Any any words of wisdom on that? It sounds That's like you have already it. got it, Fred, and you are just <laughs> you're trying to get the exclamation point at the end of a sentence you have already written. But let me just say, uh, as someone who loves, loves to read about, learn about and observe, um, uh, the the interactions between organisms like my specialty in entomology is symbiosis so how do creatures interact with each other well those pseudoscorpions are super cool but their symbiotic connection to the honeybees needs to be deepened over a substantial evolutionary time before the bees are going to be comfortable just letting them roam the colony willy-nilly mm -hmm. uh, or before the bees will let them climb on to their own bodies and snatch the the varroa mites out of the areas where they're embedded so mm -hmm. it really seems like the region of the colony where those creatures have free reign is the bottom board when the mites have fallen out of the colony the pseudoscorpions are opportunistic enough to go after them and eat them. Mm -hmm. And that's a great meal for the pseudoscorpion that it doesn't have to work hard for. But mm -hmm. you can accomplish the same thing with a sticky board. Um, the mites aren't gonna be able to climb back up. And to begin with, those are not your best and brightest mites. Those mites that have fallen out of the colony on their own aren't mm -hmm. doing that great. They're either right. sick already, they're losing yeah. legs, they've been bitten or they're old and they probably weren't gonna be able to climb back up into the colony to begin with. What would be amazing is if the pseudoscorpion relationship was like the symbiotic relationships that some pseudoscorpions in South America have with the stingless bees there, where there's an entire section of the colony that is just dedicated to them uh, living there, and the bees allow them to walk around and grab um, potential mite parasites uh, away from areas of the colony where they could be problematic. 
Apis mellifera doesn't have that kind of relationship yet. And as a result, when the varroa mites go into the cells, they get under the cell capping, uh, those mites or uh, the pseudoscorpions have no ability to go after those mites. The pseudoscorpions mm -hmm. have no ability to go after the mites that are on the adult bees. And mm -hmm. so they really have very, very, very um, limited utility just because of the fact that they're, they have free reign over an area of the colony where the mites that end up there aren't doing that great. That's really, that's interesting. What a great answer. <laughs> and also, I think often people hear about what you just described, that they are successful with some of their species, mm -hmm. and therefore they make this bridge to Apis mellifera thinking, and they'll work there too. Mm -hmm. And it, right. it could one day, but remember that these right. sorts of relationships are developed over lengthy evolutionary time. Sometimes we can give things a shove in the right direction, but even that is not a quick experience. Okay, so when you're studying uh, predatory insects or predatory behaviors, I'm not sure whether the two are <laughs> oh. connected. Mm -hmm. but by the way, I love mud dauber wasps. Oh. And the way that I was just showing this to my grandson just a couple of days ago, I said, look at that mud dauber wasp in that spider web. It's mm -hmm. not stuck. Mm -hmm. said, what do you mean? I said, watch, the spider comes out. It's going to be a sad day for that spider. <laughs> and, it, and it nabs a spider and flies away with it. Yep. And that it's great. Is, and where's my camera when this <laughs> happens? I never have a camera. And this but is what, what I, I mean. Yeah. Okay. So, this is this is what I'm talking about with those evolutionary relationships that yeah. probably developed over millions of years of back mm -hmm. and forth. There's probably a mud dauber who crashed into a web and was like, oh, wait, my uh, exoskeleton is slippery enough where I can bounce off of this. And then it sees a spider coming towards it. It's like, you look delicious, buddy. And it can just grab it and fly off. That is a classic <laughs> predator becomes prey moment. Mm -hmm. and, it is, and, and people don't feel bad because they don't like those little orb weaving spiders anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, so what I wanted to ask you is uh, when you're studying behaviors like that, was there an insect you came across that just blew your mind just oh. in the way that it can hunt or uh, how aggressive it is mm -hmm. or, you know, just give us a story. Absolutely. So I have known for a long time <laughs> that I enjoy entomology, but one of my favorite pastimes as a kid was seeing how insects and arachnids will interact with each other. So I would get all of my mom's pickle jars, mayonnaise jars, all the different jars from the house that were sitting in the recycling bin, I'd grab them and put two different bugs in there and then just watch how they interact with each other. Eventually I moved up to having whole terraria and cages for this. and it was always so interesting to me to see that when I put a praying mantis in a container with anything, any, any of the bugs, no matter how big they were, or even creatures that were not insects at all, the praying mantis always seemed to have the capacity to subdue it. And it was so remarkable to see. And so I started learning more about them and how pretty much every bit of their anatomy has been restructured from the typical insect structuring to something that is a lot more efficient for predation. Their mouth parts are very, very, very well adapted mm -hmm. uh, to chew through all kinds of contexts. They can chew through the bones of uh, other creatures. They can chew through the exoskeleton of other insects. Uh, there is an incredible video of the Hiragula mantis, one of the, the larger praying mantises out there in the Amazon, hanging upside down from a plant. And its body is very green. It looks like a, a, a section of the plant. And then a snake slithers under it. And the Hiragula mantis grabs the snake and is able to use these really serrated elements of its front legs called raptorial forelegs to just kind of saw through um, the, the head until it severs. Uh, and you know what? It's probably a little bit too uh, graphic to discuss. No, no, no. But... You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this by... is nature. Through a combination of sawing through with those raptorial forelegs and chewing with mm -hmm. these really, really, really uh, sharp mouth parts, there it was able to chew off the head uh, of the snake, which of course is the dangerous section of the snake, and mm -hmm. make uh, a wonderful meal out of the rest of it. Because Hiragula mantids, they lay a rather substantial number of eggs. And they create this frothy mass around yeah. the eggs uh, that kind of thermoregulates the eggs and protects them, keeps them from getting too hot, too cold, too dry, too wet. 
Uh, and it's quite remarkable, but it takes a lot of protein to do all of that. Mm -hmm. And so they need big meals. That's the reason why the females eat the males in the mating process and why males who the female has been trying to eat him. And even if he escapes, uh, oftentimes he will go back to the female and let her continue eating him because he knows well, we don't know if he knows, but evolutionarily, the yeah. guys who allow themselves yeah. to be consumed have a lot more babies than the ones who do not. That is, and that that foamy egg mass that you just mm -hmm. described, how does that harden? I mean, yeah, right? then it hardens up. What is it going does. on chemically it does. there? What is so it, it, there, uh, it hardens in uh, reaction to the air around it. Um, some okay. of it is a drying process, but some of it is a chemical cross-linking um, mm -hmm. that occurs there, but it does harden. It makes a really tough shell around the eggs. Yeah. It's also very shock absorbent. So if they lay their eggs uh, around a branch of a tree that ends up falling to the ground, it's so shock absorbent. It can fall quite a substantial distance and those babies uh, will not be affected by that negatively. Wow. And the female will produce that whether she's made it or not. She, yeah, well, so unfortunately, <laughs> if she produces that and is not mated, uh, this is just the biological processes running their course, um, but they will right. not hatch. She will not be able to, to further her offspring. Yeah, because I mean, because uh, we had a large green, see, I don't know the specific scientific term for it, but it's a large green female praying mantis that decided to document everything she did, mm -hmm. which I can't even put on YouTube because it's so horrific. Oh, no. But Probably well, because she form. would, and I just as you noted, look at the design of this thing, where her forelimbs are, which mm -hmm. she had a better name for, and the <laughs> mouth and everything. Look how skinny her thorax is, mm -hmm. and her abdomen's way out of reach. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, when she gets a hold of something that even fights back, mm -hmm. it can't reach any of her sensitive organs, really exactly. soft parts of her body. And then she ate the face off of a European hornet. Yes. Exactly. No, but I mean, just, and that thing is alive. It's, it's legs are going and she just starts eating. And this is the hardest, like, mm -hmm. like you look at a, a part of an insect that doesn't really have a place to get a hold of. Mm -hmm. That is the most efficient mouth in the insect kingdom. And that's what one of the reasons on? why those raptorial forelegs are so important in this process, because yeah. when they grab an insect and then they can roll it into those forelegs, even though its body yeah. is pretty slippery, those spines embed itself in the, the matrix of their, um, their exoskeleton and they've got a really good grip and then they can just start chewing on it. They don't kill it first, they have no venom, they're not gonna paralyze it, they right. just incapacitate it by holding it tightly and then they just go to town on it. Well, I also, um, put a, a praying mantis and a European hornet in the same cage together to see, okay, what exactly is going to happen here? And this is one of the Chinese mantids. So a pretty big mantis, but yeah. the hornet was much more buff and seemed like it had the capacity to win this fight, given that it's Flesh got this weaponized stinger. Exactly. Yeah. It's got those big serrated mandibles and that stinger. And I saw the hornet sting the mantis in the mouth. She drops the hornet, goes over the top of the cage for a bit, starts stroking her antenna in her face. Then she looks over at the hornet. She's like, we're going to go for round two. And I was sure, oh, this is going to be the end of her. She was stung in the mouth. I mean, I get stung anywhere by a European hornet, and that's probably the end of my day. <laughs> but not her. So she goes after it again, this time gets a better grip on it and is able to hold its abdomen down until it's got its whole head chewed off. And then it doesn't have as much to worry about and kind of relaxes a bit. But yeah. she was, there was no problem, it seems, from yeah. having even been stung in the mouth. That's it. Ours, when the European hornet was in the habitat, she ran after it. Like mm -hmm. there wasn't even any delay. Mm -hmm. It was the most amazing thing. And also this is, I use the mantis when people ask often, especially beekeepers, they, you know, do bees suffer? Do they feel pain? And I use the mantis and you described it already. Uh, the male mated mm -hmm. with the mantis and then mm -hmm. came back. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it gets worse. Uh, they've eaten the head off of the exactly. male. And then his body continues by mating. itself went mm -hmm. over and, and did the mating. Mm -hmm. And so if it's feeling pain, I don't know how it would demonstrate that. Yeah. So they're really almost coded to perform specific things in a specific way. And it seems to go on without, you know, they, they, if a mantis chews their feet off or their head or whatever. And uh, do you find that there's 
they have a reactive stimulus, mm -hmm. which again, you probably will describe much better, but um, <laughs> they don't seem to really feel pain. And the other thing, if we're talking about the cozy, friendly honeybee, mm -hmm. look what they do to the drones at mm -hmm. the end of the year. Sometimes That's they'll rough. even sting them. Yeah. Right? Because the drones just don't seem to to fully get it that they are being evicted and <laughs> so sometimes they have to get a couple of stings before they really recognize oh, i'm no longer wanted here yeah. and then they go off somewhere and starve to death which is yeah. really sad so, so think about that when you wonder if they feel pain mm -hmm. so, so i i asked uh, dr cole gilbert at cornell university uh, this the same question do we have a good reason to believe that insects do not feel pain now mm -hmm. of course there are anecdotal stories um, that can be provided there uh, is is one story that i was listening to on npr where um a a um i believe it was a, a sun scorpion or some a, a certain kind of arachnid was in its own container uh, it gets hurt and some of its viscera is exposed, some of its its own, um, its midgut, um, mm -hmm. it ruptures through the wall of its, um, its exoskeleton, and it smells it and thinks that it's food, it thinks that it's another creature that it can eat, and starts chewing on its own viscera. Yeah, now, I knew where you are going to go. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> pretty gross, pretty gross. Uh... That does signal to people, okay, these creatures don't seem to have the same capacity to feel pain that other organisms would. If that happened to uh, a cat, the cat would know immediately if it sure. touched that, oh, oh, that hurts, that's something that I shouldn't touch. Well, mm -hmm. Um, the reason for that is because they have these um, bundles of neurons that we refer to as nociceptors, and the nociceptors are what are used by vertebrates to transmit signals of pain. And while insects uh, have certain kinds of stretch receptors and pressure receptors on their bodies um, that can clearly feel that pressure is being applied or that their body is being stretched or is upside down or that mm -hmm. they're underwater, um, it doesn't we don't have the evidence to show that they feel pain. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't. They may have an entirely different neurological system um, that developed in a totally different way between the protostomes and the deuterostomes, which gave rise to the, the invertebrates and the vertebrates. But um, we, we just don't have the evidence for it at this time. Yeah. That doesn't mean they don't, though. No, no. But I don't want you to you know go into mourning every time you see... Yeah an injured bee or if our you have to squish a queen one day are managed honeybees a threat to native pollinators Ooh, you keep asking me these questions for which the answer is going to be complex and nuanced and i appreciate it uh, allow me to say here that there has been something of a rivalry at times between the native bee researchers and the honeybee researchers, because honeybees are not native to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them the European bee for a reason. They were brought over um, uh, with the settlers to the U.S. And for a while by the, the native people here were referred to as the white man's fly. And okay. now mm -hmm. we are working yeah. hard to save the white man's fly. And I think that honeybees are incredible. I'm glad that they're here. Uh, a lot of elements of our own food security is because of how hard those honeybees work on a regular basis. But it is also the case that when you bring an organism into an ecosystem that it was not originally from, there are unintended consequences, there are impacts to that um, that we oftentimes don't expect. Uh, honeybees can be reservoirs for a number of viruses. And it has been shown that uh, in the same way that a dirty doorknob can be the epicenter for the spread of viruses between human beings, a flower can be the dirty doorknob of their biological system. When they land on that flower, when they're sipping the nectar and collecting the pollen from that flower, they can leave behind viral remnants that uh, bumblebees or carpenter bees, uh, insects that have uh, either smaller colonies or no colonies at all, uh, can be much more heavily impacted by those viruses than the honeybees themselves. A honeybee can be one individual in a colony of 60,000 individuals. And so for one of them to get a virus and die, the impact of that is substantially diluted than when you're talking about a bumblebee colony, uh, which has uh, an order of magnitude fewer bees in it than the honeybees or a carpenter bee, uh, which is doing all of its work solitary. So those are the sorts of things where um, we do have to consider 
if the honeybee populations are not kept healthy, uh, the impacts on the honeybees are pretty dramatic, but the effects that it has more broadly across the ecosystem of other bees and other pollinators can be even more dramatic and even more po problematic. Um, mm -hmm. But it does not have to be the case that the honeybees are an issue for the other bees in the ecosystem. Uh, if there are enough floral resources, they can certainly share those floral resources. And so it is up to us to make sure that these things don't become problems. We need to keep our bees healthy and mm -hmm. that way they won't be spreading all these viruses around. Uh, we need to make sure that there's enough food out here. And we have not been doing that well. We've been taken in by this idea that our front lawn needs to be just a ton of heavily manicured green grass when that provides nothing of any value to the pollinators around here. Um, and furthermore, our system of factory farming leaves our bees with typically just one food source available to them when we take them uh, out to pollinate. And so it's, it's important for us to consider um, that there are ways that the bees can be, the honeybees can be problematic for the native bees, but they do not have to be. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of management and matching up with the resources available and not being Precisely. the one who takes the lion's share from everything. Precisely. Okay, so I've been told by you that I'm gonna be running out of time here soon. So I have to ask some <laughs> other really good questions. All right, lightning round. Tell us something about yourself that uh, most people don't know about you. Oh. What is something about myself that most people don't know about me? Um, it is my goal in life to have a coconut crab as a pet and to walk it around on a leash around the university. Yeah. Like, have you ever seen one uh, of these? I know exactly what they are. And they move little kids' toys around the backyard and everything. <gasps> they climb fences. Yes. Because I think that's at, um, what's the island here? I'm drawing a blank. So they're, uh, they're on Easter Island. Um, they big, are- a Big Navy base. Oh. Uh, um, uh, in they're in Japan. Guam, uh, Guam, 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 Guam. Yes, <laughs> yes. They're adorable. Keep are the they not adorable? Inside, the coconut crabs are in the backyard. Yes, okay. <laughs> they're amazing. All Unfortunately, right. some people eat them, but I want to like you know have them on a leash and just walk a couple of them around the university at times. And I want to be that quirky guy. But imagine how much of a conversation starter it would be if you're walking your dog and you see a guy out with a gigantic purple crab that's just walking down the street with him. You know. I think you're going to spend a lot of time alone. Yeah. Ouch. People are going to people are going to get their little chihuahua out of the way of that thing. They're going to be they're going to be running. Here comes you cut me real Sammy deep. with that whatever that is. You cut me deep, Fred. That's, you cut uh, me real deep just now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry only not. Anyway. So they don't they have like one big crushing Yeah, that giant claw. claw. Yeah. <laughs> of all the weird pets I mean, they, they, some I'm, the symmetrical claws um, they can have, like, it's not always just okay. a big giant claw. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's that one. And now we will be putting links to the things that you're involved with mm -hmm. um, down in the video description. Also Sweet. for those who are listening on Podbean, all the links will be there uh, so they can do stuff. What are your final words for viewers who are keeping bees? Uh, any overall message about husbandry or? For sure. What, what do you want to share? When individuals take care of animals, we have a responsibility having taken these creatures out of their natural setting to keep them as healthy as we can possibly keep them. When an organism is domesticated or semi-domesticated like the honeybees, the big difference between it and its progenitors, uh, between it and the other creatures out in the wild, is that that organism does better in the presence of humans than it does out in the wild. Well, our honeybees have, we have developed our honeybees in a way where uh, they're, they, they need uh, a lot of what we contribute. And so we have to be responsible. We have to be responsible and make sure that we are feeding them. We have to be responsible and make sure that they have all the forage that they need around them. They have the diversity of plants necessary to self-medicate when needed. And we have to make sure that they are not just overrun by preventable parasitic diseases that we could have done something about. Um, I am looking forward to a day where we'll never have to treat another honeybee for Varroa, hopefully tropolalaps. Uh, and so I am conducting research on these organisms 
Um, and this work, a lot of this work is also being funded by a nonprofit that I started called the Ramsey Research Foundation. And there are beekeepers who have been contributing quite consistently um, through their beekeeping groups locally, their state groups and everything. And I really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, anyone who's listening to this who has been uh, a contributor in the past. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about what the Ramsey Research Foundation is doing and our goal of seeing honeybees uh, be varroa free one day, then you can find us at www.ramseyresearchfoundation.org. Excellent. Nice wrap up. And <laughs> they can find those links also in the video description. And Sweet. don't forget to check out Dr. Bugs. You want to hear some <laughs> talented music, watch that. And of course, uh, your YouTube channel, people should be subscribing just in case you make another video. Yes. One day that wraps it up. Thank you so much for joining me for an interview, Dr. Samuel Ramsey. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a great talk. Oh, it has been a great talk. Thank you so much for inviting me, Fred. I've really enjoyed this. You're a great interviewer. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> and that wraps up another episode of interviews with experts. I want to thank you for spending some of your time with me today. Please don't forget to look for links down in the video description. If you're enjoying this series, I invite you to like the video and subscribe to my channel. This is also a podcast on Podbean, the way to be. I'm Frederick Dunn, and I wish you all the best in beekeeping. Thank you for being here today.